Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno's Best Comics of the Week, and this is the show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. We go least favorite to best pick of the week and everything in between, and at the end of the video, we talk about the viewer's pick of the week, so in the comments below, let me know your pick of the week. Now, I didn't have a review last week because I was at San Diego Comic-Con. I'm going to have some coverage, or I put some Batman interviews up. I did my haul. I have a couple other interviews coming up, so look forward to that. But I, I do know I missed out on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and NYX. Uh, just know for a small, short note, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles wasn't exactly for me as someone who wasn't a fan, but definitely appreciated the art uh, of the book and also just appreciate that fans can have such a high caliber book for, for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and NYX. Fun enough to, for me to pick up the second issue. So those are the two big books I didn't get to talk about. And those are my Spark Notes version. But let's get into uh, this week's comic books. I had about 11 books this week. So number 11 was a new book as well that I kind of got on whim. And that is X-Force issue 1. I'm not usually a big X-Force fan, but with this new X-Men line, I want to try out most of the titles. I'm not saying I'm going to try them all out, but I want to check out Psylocke and Rachel's relationship. I, I don't really know much about it from the outside looking in. It seemed like it was formed during Krakoa. I wasn't really reading X-Men during Krakoa, so I was like, all right, let me check this out. I don't really feel like it was very new reader friendly. I feel like the team was put together really quickly, and that's what happens when there's so many team books out there. I just feel like there wasn't the chemistry and the reason for this book to be out but I think if you are a hardcore fan of these characters this is a book where you get to read them uh, it's solid artwork there's an interesting enough cliffhanger but not enough for me to want to read more and not enough for me to be convinced that this is a series that is a must buy so overall giving that one two stars and that is number 11 moving on to number 10 which is super pets special the Bite Identity Crisis this is a kind of parody book the super friends super pets situation there wasn't a lot of dc books out this week which is mostly why i picked this up and i do like a fun comedy book every once in a while you'll see another one here that marvel had but I i'm not a huge fan of the pet stories it's funny because tony fleeks who's writing feral and and obviously wrote stray dogs that's kind of my limit of the the dog uh type or pet type stories usually from marvel and dc i tend not to read them i think also the closest that I would probably read is Jeff, just because I think it really leans into the comedy. Here, I felt like it was more about the adventures of, of the cat and dogs uh, and more animals from the DC Universe teaming up. And it just didn't do much for me. I think the funniest probably was the Watchmen story at the end. I was like, oh, that was at least a cool parody of something we all know and love from DC. But overall, I don't think this is necessary to pick up unless you are a hardcore fan of these pets. So giving that two and a half stars, and that is number 10. Moving on to number nine, which is Gromit, issue three. This is a miniseries. And it's also, it's interesting because it's a slice of life. It, every issue kind of focuses on a new sector of these characters, all while playing with the punk rock 80s, 90s history here. And you can tell this is just coming from the history of the creative team. It's just them telling their childhood and, and what they dealt with and, and you know, how they formed friendships and, and what it was like before the internet and, and what kids did before the internet. So in that lens, I really liked it. I don't know if I feel for any of these characters. I think that's why this tends to be a little lower for me as someone who was not alive during the 80s and, and never really grew up in this time of like skater culture. It, it just, I don't know if I fully connect to it, but I think the artwork is really good. And I like the idea of having a Slice of Life comic. I feel like there's just not enough out there. So I want to support that. And again, just learn more about this world, even if I don't fully relate to it. So giving that... Three stars, and that is number, I believe that was nine. Moving on to number eight, which is Absolute Power Task Force Issue 3. We're already up to Issue 3 of this anthology tie-in, but we I think we've only had one issue of Absolute Power, which is kind of wild to me. Usually these events go really quickly. They are released like every week, I feel. And, and this event in particular, I feel like I don't know anything about it. We had one issue and all these tie-ins, there's been so many of them, has been like, well, this is happening in Absolute Power. I'm like, is it? I, I've really only read that first issue. I, I feel like that only scratched the surface of what's going on. 
with Amanda Waller and and this superhero law that she's bringing, which is very familiar to things that Marvel has already done. I thought this issue as a Carol fan was fun. I, I like that Jeremy Adams is bringing what he's been doing in Green Lantern and instilling it here with some team members and characters that she doesn't usually get to interact with, like JSA. I like that she's questioning herself as a hero. Like, where does she belong as a hero? That's the elements I probably enjoyed the most here. The Steve Trevor stuff, I, I wasn't as connected to. I also don't... I love and dislike that they keep focusing on different characters because I love the idea that we're getting characters we normally won't get a series from, like Carol Ferris. And, you know, I'm excited to see Nightwing in the next issue, but is it actually doing much for the story... I don't know. I, I just like the little pockets here, I think is the best way to put it. So there's little pockets I enjoyed with this issue, but I don't I don't know if, if it's been timed correctly with the event. So giving that three stars, and that is number eight. Yes, that was number eight. Moving on to number seven, which is the last issue of Ghost Lore, Ghost Lore issue 12. The overall theme was wrapped up nicely here. We get to see the father-daughter dynamic end where the daughter is like, I will sacrifice myself to talk to the dead and, and kind of be that person for them. But really, it's a story about them not being able to communicate with each other and they finally are able to communicate. I love the artwork here. I, I just think that Leo, Ma Leo Mix, I think that's your friend, Leo, Ma Leo Max, uh, is able to just do horror so well. I, I loved his work on on Basketful of Heads, and I feel like that is really instilled here, even from the coloring as well, which I think it is a different colorist for the book. Yeah, so it's colored by Jason Wordy. And I think the colors really work here, and I, I like the, the visuals of this book and the world that was built, but I feel the actual premise was a little loosey-goosey here, so once you get to the, the finale of the premise, you're like, okay, they, they're opening these gates to kind of talk to the dead, but there wasn't a lot more past that, and I wanted a bit more from the father-daughter relationship and really get to the, the crust of why they had a bad relationship to begin with. And I think that's something that could have made it a more powerful ending, but I still overall liked it. And again, I like the, the surface level themes that were explored here. So giving that three stars and that is number seven. Moving on to number six, which is The Amazing Spider-Man issue 54. Same old, same old. It's so weird that the end of this issue says the end. And I was like, oh, I guess it's the end of this run. And it's like, no, we still have one more arc. I'm like, okay, that was kind of a weird way to just kind of end this arc, even though it's like the penultimate ending of the arc. This issue, again, it's same old, same old. Peter has this green goblin in him. Him and Norman are trying to figure out what to do with it. They seem to eliminate the green goblin by the end and it's like if that is something that is actually continued that's great i think that could be very interesting for the mythos of spider-man if green goblin does not exist anymore i don't know what that's going to mean for the overall story is spider-man but if he doesn't exist for you know a couple of years that could kind of be fun where we get to see this kinder norman which i've been enjoying and i like the artwork a lot here i think that's what was really strong about this issue but the actual story is just I feel like they could do so much more with the entity of Green Goblin that just isn't done here. It's just very exposition forward that doesn't work. And then you're kind of tagging back to Miss Marvel and Rick Rap, and, and that doesn't really fit here either. It just doesn't feel like this ultimate ending that I want for a run that has lasted a long time. But we'll see where that final arc does go. So giving that one three stars, and then it's number six. Moving on to number five. What if Donald Duck became Wolverine issue one? I heard the first version of this was good. I forget what character he was. I know Nexus, Thor, this time it was Wolverine. And what I liked about this issue is I think it connected to that previous book pretty well. It seems like it referenced that well and, and what's going to come without it feeling like you have to read those other one shots to enjoy this. If you like Wolverine, there's just a lot of fun parodies here. This is to the, the first cover he was on. It's just a fun comic where you can see Mickey Mouse as Hawkeye and Goofy as Hulk and, and they get to have interactions with each other and again kind of goof around do I think it's a necessary book no I don't think it's funny enough that I was like I gotta get that next issue like again an example of uh, the Jeff book that I really enjoy but I think it was fun enough if you have a light haul and, and you want to kind of break apart your 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 haul and and have a palette cleanser so overall giving that one three and a half stars also a lot of fun artwork Disney art here as well so if you like those covers too uh, it's a it's a good version of that Moving on to number four, which is Spider-Gwen, Ghost Spider, issue three. The topic of this issue is 
something we've seen with Spider-Man many times. Chameleon's out there. He's pretending to be Spider-Gwen. Everyone's like, what's going on? And Gwen has this internal conflict of, what do I do? I don't want people to think this. Also, here's the secret I'm keeping of why I'm actually here, which I do want more nods to. I want more clues to that. I, I feel like it's kind of a dangling apple right now. But I think the emotion that was done here was done well. You get to see Gwen's father. You get to see her interact with Cindy and, and Miles. And for me, that's what made this a fun issue. It was solid enough artwork, even if it was a kind of cliche issue. So overall, giving that one three and a half stars, and that is number four. Moving on to number three, the topic of the video, which is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issue one, the finale. It's pretty much been alluded there will be more Power Rangers, but we don't really know to what extent. Will it be another series? Will they reboot the universe? This issue, I think, did a really good job at celebrating what has come before with Shattered Grid and the honestly the mythology they've been building here and i think there's a lot of characters that get to shine but especially kimberly which i really like because kimberly is my favorite ranger and you just get to see her in, in the front lines but then you do get some good emotional moments between billy and jason and tommy and and even bulk and skull get some moments to kind of shine here and, and something i really liked about the art is that there's a lot going on there's a lot of rangers you kind of have to follow but it's all very clean where you're like okay i get who that ranger is i know where that ranger is and it just kind of works for this issue I don't know if uh, this blew my mind as a finale because I don't think it was kind of building to that, but I think it's kind of this subtle ending of like, hey, this is the end of this chapter. There might be more after and they kind of keep this open door to do so. And I liked it. I, I was pretty satisfied with it. Again, I wish it kind of blew my mind a little bit more than it did, but I think if you're a fan, you'll, you'll just kind of have a good time of these characters interacting and getting to fight along each other. And, and you don't need to really have a big cliffhanger to have a good ending. So like I said, I think it was pretty solid, and I do want to see where Power Rangers goes from here. So giving that four stars, if you haven't read the Power Rangers comics, I should also add, they're some of the best comics on stand. It's the best team book out there. It's a really consistent book from issues one to, like, what are we up to, 100 and... 40 something uh, it's so many good issues of a comic that just is very consistent from different creative teams that is that kind of unheard of if you have like three or four different voices and it still kind of feels like the same voice so go pick up power rangers if you haven't Moving on to number two, which is Ultimate Spider-Man issue seven. Pretty solid issue. It's a little slower than maybe some of the previous ones, but we're definitely building to some bigger moments. We get some good Gwen interactions with MJ. We get to see, I like the most, the Uncle Ben and J. Jonah Jameson thing going on and, and you're you're seeing their their publication kind of form i really like that side of things because it's just so different from what we've seen from spider-man and then yeah there's still the question of is green goblin a good guy is he a bad guy and you still get that tug and pull pull but really what made this issue was the ending where iron man or iron man type character shows up and he's like well are, are you ready to be a hero yet and you're like oh man are they gonna join the avengers how is this gonna be connected to the other books going on it's finally kind of feeling like a universe so I like that. I thought that was a pretty big moment for, you know, an issue that tried to fit a lot of plot lines that maybe didn't progress a lot of plot lines. But still, every moment I was reading it, I was still having a good time. You're like, oh, I want to see more of MJ. That was kind of a cool interaction. And then you move on to different things that are slowly progressing. So giving that four stars, and that is number two. Moving on to number one which is Saga issue 67 is the return of the book. And I thought it was pretty solid where we get to see Hazel in a new setting. They tend to do new settings with these arcs and it's like almost a carnival setting. And you just kind of get to see where everyone's at, where her mom's at, her brother. And I liked how you led to the end of her saying, you know, 12 was a really hard year, which, you know, 12 is a hard year for everybody. And she's like, but at least I got to meet my my best friend. And I, I mean, the, the, that's what I love about Saga. I feel like even if it's been gone for six months, you just jump in. You're like, cool, new setting, same Hazel, great, 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 great narration where you just kind of get sucked in again. And I think not every comic can do that after a long hi hiatus, but Saga does with just some wonderful art, creative world building. And it just kind of, again, it just kind of sucks you in again. Was it the best issue of Saga? No, but it, it, it reminds me why I like this world. So I'm going to give that four stars. That is my pick of the week. Let me know in the comments below what your favorite book of the week. This was Comic Uno. Next week, I'll have the viewer's pick of the week because I had a skip last week. There was no viewer's pick of the week. So hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic Uno, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.